Thank you, Hayden, and welcome again to everyone here this evening. Um, this evening we have a fellowship dinner after the service. Um, praise God for those who brought plates with them. Uh, just please uh, make sure that there's no waste eats. It's a shame for people to work hard and to prepare food and then have somebody just send me throw in the bin because they put too much in their plate. So please be cautious about that. And parents always take care of your children. Make sure wastage just does not honour God nor those who made the food. Um, Wednesday, our Bible study time at 7 p.m. and the course in Bible geography and customs goes to 8:15. Friday, kids club at 4:30, preaching training at 6:30 and 7 o'clock youth group. This Saturday, 8 o'clock is our men's prayer breakfast. And keep in mind, please, the Easter services, 15th to 17th of April. A good Friday will be here at 10 a.m. in the morning. Easter service normally at uh, 10 a.m. And our family camp, 6 to 8 May. Next week, we'll be handing out leaflets. We want people to fill them in. If you're going, fill them in, hand them in straight away because they need to be organised properly. We can't sit down and cross our uh, fingers hoping someone will come or they won't come. So next week, there'll be leaflets handed out to people when they come in and they need to fill them, put them in the building fund box of this so they know exactly who's coming. All right, um, please give him people in, in prayer for those people not well amongst us. We've had uh, Brother Walid's uh, dad go to hospital last week and surprisingly, he recovered and home again. And uh, Sister Amy, Ron's mum, was in hospital and surprisingly, she recovered and home again. And for the first time for a long time, we had uh, Brother Abdul Masih's dad come to church in the evening service uh, or in the, uh, on Friday, which is a miracle and a half. He's rejoicing God that he can come to church. So a lot of people now miss that aren't doing the best. And so please be in prayer for them. All right, we have, um, we're turning to uh, the epistle of James chapter 1 and verses 9 through 11. James chapter 1, New Testament, verses 9 through 11. This is a book of uh, correction for Christians and its uh, instruction is practical Christian living. So all the messages out of James is practical Christian living. James chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner arisen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Let's bow for prayer, please. Thank you, Father, for this your word, for the encouragement received from it. Give us the grace, Lord, to allow it to sink into our hearts and to be applied in our everyday practice. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. There's been many messages in the past regarding the proper attitude towards wealth and money. Uh, Matthew preached the last time in the morning service some um, weeks ago about um, uh, principles, about money. We had um, Michael last Friday night speak about uh, Psalm 73, how Asaph envied the rich when he saw their prosperity. And there's a lot of things where people think that money is definitely, definitely, definitely the pathway to a better life. Whether you're a Christian or not a non-Christian, you can always see the benefit of having some more money. I would not be one little bit upset if I was suddenly loaded upon with a whole lot of money. I'd rejoice. I would rejoice a whole lot. So I'm not against money. I don't think anyone's against money. But the Bible gives a lot of warnings against putting our trust in money. So the whole issue is trusting in riches, not riches. If you look in the Bible, the richest people in the Bible, Abraham, had over a thousand servants in his household. King David, that guy had so much money, he gave billions, or sorry, maybe multitude of millions towards the building of the temple. And he wasn't allowed to build it, but no one could stop him giving towards it. And if on Solomon, the richest men on planet Earth, where silver was just nothing, the count in the land when he was when he's there. But the thing is this, riches is no problem. It's a blessing from God. The problem is when we put our trust in riches. Tonight we're looking at rich man, poor man. Economic inequality is worldwide. I think from the start of, of, of time, it's been worldwide. Every society has its rich and its poor. You have the multi-billionaires. I had the occasion of looking into some of these billionaires in the Arab lands where the oil is so, so rich that a guy for breakfast can order some eggs from South Australia, some tomatoes from, from uh, South America, and uh, cherries from some other place and bring it in. So his breakfast costs him maybe about a million bucks. That's nothing, just money. 
You look at his car. One guy's car was gold plated. Another one it was made out of silver, not silver plated, made out of silver. His house was so, so, so long, it's like a great big hotel. You do like a, a happy laps up and down for exercise. It was so, so big. No way could he enjoy that place. No way. It was just bigger and better. Well, see, they got so much money, what do I do with it? They collect Rolls Royces like a person collects bottle tops. They just so much money. And then you have another person, another side of the world in third world countries, if he gets to eat one meal every two days, he's doing good. Absolutely thin as can be. All you see is skin and bone. Their life expectancy is very, very, very low. Same planet. We throw away more food in our bins than a lot of world, 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 people in world, 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 world countries can enjoy. Our bins are full of food. We just throw away. I mean, on, we get stuff on uh, Fridays from... Uh, uh, leftovers from Woolworths and Coles and IGA and stuff like that, where uh, it's been on the shelf too long, let's take it off, put new stuff on the shelf. It's good stuff. Okay, we just let's, let's, let's circulate our stuff on the shelf. And what are they going to do with that? Well, if they don't give it to someone, they'll throw it away. Well, see, this, this is our economy we have. We have the super rich and those people have to scratch for a living. Well, when I was a young person, I was flying to Lebanon and the plane was flying over um, Hong Kong. And as you go over the place, great big massive skyscrapers, wow. Then come a certain spot, shanties, tin sheds, all rusted. I'm thinking, what? In the same place? Tin sheds and great big massive buildings over here? What's going on? You got the rich, you got the poor. Even in affluent societies, there's a sense of equality. And sometimes the gap is very, very wide, sometimes not so wide. Here in Australia, no one has a right to go hungry. Those people who live off addictions and sacrifice their food for their different addictions, okay, they go hungry. You go down the city and you find people sleeping on, par sleeping on park benches. In fact of life. They're sleeping in the streets. It's fact of life. Because they, they, in their own lifestyles, you find they, uh, the money they get from Centrelink and all the rest of it isn't taken care of properly. People normally strive to get more and more thinking, that's what you do. If someone gave you an offer for a better job, which means more money, you take it. Why? Well, obviously it's more money. So the pursuit of money, people feel, feel subconsciously, is the pursuit of happiness. But there's one problem with that. Anything can turn circumstances around. We've had COVID-19 for a couple of years, and my impression is the mismanagement of our, of our governments around the world, not just Australia, around the world, led to bankruptcy for many, many places. Loss of jobs, loss of income, we have the war now between Russia and Ukraine. That would mess them up big time. And people, they used to have jobs, don't have any jobs anymore. They don't have any homes anymore. They're living from scraps, whatever it may be. It's just normal around the world that we have some people very well off and some people scratching. Well, due to persecutions in our passage over here, the Jews in Jerusalem and uh, we were... Um, were persecuting many of the, uh, the believers because they knew faith in Christ. In James 1 it says, a servant of Jesus, uh, James, a servant of God and of Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. They're scattered because the persecution has been going on before them. Now because the persecution and the people aren't able to work, they've been sacked from their jobs, you find uh, God has moved upon some people to go and sell their lands and sell their houses and take the money and give to the apostles for distribution amongst the saints. And they did that person after person after person, which means they were left without. But then persecution would stop. And what happened then? Those who sold their possessions had nothing. And there were those who didn't have to sell them. They still got their possessions. So now you're going to have believers, those who are with and those who don't have. And just simply the way God worked things out. And so this is the situation with James. He's writing to them about this paradox. And he's saying now, you guys who are poor, rejoice, he exalted. You are rich, rejoice. Why? Because you've been humbled down. It's a paradox. It doesn't make sense. In Matthew 10, 39, he that finds his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Does that make sense? How about Acts 20, 35? More blessed to give than to receive. And 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, and 10, Paul said, I glory in my infirmities, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And James says, hey, let's join trials. Now, these paradoxes, in the plain little sense, don't make sense. 
But when you think of it spiritually, it makes a lot of sense. The humble are exalted, and the greatest, that are so full of pride, are lowered down and humbled. That's a good thing. If God leads a, a proud person in his state, will only be to his ruin. And God, when he humbles one, he should rejoice and praise God for that humility. In James we have here, Poor brethren, take pride in your exalted position. Rich brethren, take pride in your humbled position. We'll look at this, this, these two points here this evening. And as I mentioned before, this is not a message against the pursuit and gaining of money. It's the trust in it. God uses finances to pay bills, put missionaries on the field, to build churches. He uses finances for everything under the sun. So it's necessary we have finances. Just don't put your heart in them. That's the only thing. All right. First thing we have over here, poverty cannot rob one of his happiness. Simple. You can be a very, very, very happy person, though poor in this world's, rich, this world's goods. Jesus Christ, I would not put down as an unhappy person. I don't think our Lord Jesus Christ was ever, ever depressed. I don't think he was worried one little bit about where's money coming for tomorrow or this person has more money than me. I don't think that at all. I don't see him ever grieving once because of lack of finances. Yet he lived on poverty level. The Bible says rejoice. This word rejoice means keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. That the brother of low degree, the person who is humbled and poor with nothing. In Luke 1, uh, 48, regarding Mary, she said, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. This low estate is the uh, term of view for the low degree. For he hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Now Mary was a poor woman, yet God exalted her and made her such an a, a honoured person that the whole world knows about Mary. How many people have named their kids Mary? Man, like heaps. And they'll keep on doing it. In the Septuagint, this word low degree refers to someone without possessions. And these people became poor for the gospel's sake. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. If you have to suffer for the gospel's sake, that's a blessing. You lose nothing by doing that. Absolutely nothing. It's an investment. People take their money and they put it into investments. Why? Because that'll make me money later on. So they take it from the they and they give it to someone else. Well, we give our money to God. That's an investment. And he pays back dividends at the right time. Acts chapter 4. I want to read to you a few passages. Verse 34 and 35. Neither was there any among them that lacked for many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And we have also in uh, Acts 2, 44 and 45. And all that believed were together and had all things common. This is the day of Pentecost and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having faith with all the people. And Lord added to the church daily such as we should be saved. Giving does not make a person miserable. It frees a person. You'd be surprised, like a person carting around a caravan. You've got a great big massive caravan, wonderful. Unhitch it and drive your car, see how you feel. Fantastic. Free that great big massive load. And for some people, a lot of wealth about them is like a caravan, toting all this stuff around that they can't use, and they'll never will be able to use, they carry wherever they go. When they feel like if they didn't have that stuff, they'd be much, much better off. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we have. Um, must be the wrong passage. Yeah, because 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is better. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the church of Macedonia, how that in great and great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty are bound under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and are beyond their power, they are willing of themselves 
praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Here the brethren of Macedonia were not rich people. They heard about the need of those in Jerusalem. There was a famine over there and people in, in need of food. And they went beyond what was expected. And the, the, I mean, so, so much they gave. And the Apostle Paul was shocked thinking, how much you guys are giving? You can't afford to. But they wanted to, and it was their, their joy, and they did it. The verse 5 says, This they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, not to us by the will of God. So we find this grace of giving is a beautiful thing that there's no one in the world is of a poor state that they can't give to God. We read about the poor widow woman. She had only two mites left. That wouldn't that'd make a farthing. Today, we don't, we don't, know, I don't have a coin that small. And she gave all. Well, I don't think she went home and starved. I think she went home and found a great big basket of fruit next to her front door and maybe a stalled ox or something. I'm sure God would have bountifully rewarded her for what she had done. Today, people leave full-time employment. I was speaking to a gentleman today. I won't tell you his name because uh, Greg Tan might get upset. So I'll speak to you about a gentleman today who looks like Greg Tan. And uh, he told me how he rejected different job offers because he wanted to have time for ministry on, on Friday 4.30. He wanted to have time to serve the Lord. Now I'm thinking, that's usual. That's just usual. I was speaking to a pastor recently and he told me that uh, he only has a part-time job each week, only a few hours every day for, for two or three days, so he has many time for the, not so much time for the ministry. He's given up extra work to have time for the ministry. That's normal. You find people leave their full-time work and go to college. Why? Because I want to prepare for the ministry to serve God. And when, they, when, they, when they're in the ministry, their income is far, far less than what they would have got in their ordinary employment. So why do they give it up? I want to serve the Lord. And some people who aren't full-time ministry, they work part-time. Why? So they have more time to serve the Lord. They do it voluntarily. That's what they want to do. And praise God for them. People who are on the mission field doing the same thing exactly. So you find that when it comes to serving God, people willingly give up income for the privilege of serving the Lord. So God says, rejoice, rejoice. In the Bible, we have a guy called Barak. And, uh, sorry, Baruch, not like James and, and Abraham and, and Kamal. So this guy, Baruch, working with uh, Jeremiah, and his brother was working with the king in the palace. And Baruch's thinking, you know, I'm working with Jeremiah, the prophet of God. Surely this must be prosperous. And what happened, Jeremiah lost favor with the king and they sought to kill him. And you can see everything's going wrong and his ministry wasn't doing well. And he started to get grieved. And God said, Baruch, seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Seek them not. I'm going to destroy this city. So if you want great things over here, it's going to be destroyed completely. Seek them not. Rejoice completely. Why? Don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't get depressed. Rejoice. Jesus Christ never owned a house or land transportation. And Christ said for someone who wanted to follow him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. I've got no fixed address. Sleeping outside, under the stars, the normal thing. John the Baptist, Christ said, of men born of women, there was none greater than John the Baptist. He lived off locusts and, and, and uh, wild honey in the desert. That was his staple diet. You want to try it? You want to try locusts and wild honey? They tell me it's good. The live locusts, they say it's good for you. Just pluck off the wings and shove it in your mouth. Someone told me down on the mission field they're doing that. And I said, well, good luck to you. We find the disciples, the disciples have took all to follow Jesus Christ. Many times in the mission field, you find those people are tested. They're low on money. They're tested about money. Hudson Taylor depending completely on income from, from England when he's in China. And he found out his mission actually borrowing money to send him. He thought, that's not right. If this money's from God, you have to go to the bank and borrow it and pay interest. So I wrote him a letter saying, look, thank you very much, but don't send me any more money. He had no other form of income, none. Just got on his knees and started praying to God. He says, I only want money, consecrated money, money from God. That's all. That's a wonderful principle. You see, it's not money that helps. It's the blessing that God puts upon the money that helps. You can have $5 and get so much, or $50 and get nothing. It's a blessing of God. 
when I was in uh, Wagga Wagga, we had next to nothing. God put us through the ringer over there for five years to teach us that man does not live by bread alone. And so we had five years over there, we had next to nothing. My wife went to shop one day with $20 to buy parkers for the four kids for the winter that's coming up. And I'm thinking, you've got to buck this chance, lady. But she went and she prayed all the way. It just so happens that Woolies that day, at the, they sold garments too down in Wagga Wagga, they had a special on. Less 50%, less 75%, like next to nothing. She spent $5 per park for the kids, brand spanking newies, and come back thinking, what happened? That's God's blessing on a few bucks. You want to go buy it full price? You made $70 a piece. And so she did very well. That's because of God's blessing. So when you want consecrated money, God will stretch it. If you just want money, they'll find bills. We're told of Elisha, and he healed Naaman. And Naaman came back and wanted to give him some money. I mean, a king's ransom. And Elisha said, no thanks. No thank you, keep it. I don't know. Wasn't even tempted. Why? I've got God. I don't need it. I've got God. I don't need it. So you take it. You take it. If God said take it, he would have taken it, but you didn't need it. Now, you take that, uh, name and you, you keep that for yourself. The poor brethren is exalted. Now you stop and think about all the spiritual blessings. Nothing, as far as spiritual blessings, you say, well, the rich get this, the poor get that. Nothing. When you think about it, we are all one in Christ, Galatians 3.28. No bond, no free, no rich, no poor. We're all adopted sons and heirs of Christ in Galatians chapter 4. We have received all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. doesn't matter what your financial status is. We're accepted in the beloved. We're seated with Christ in every places. Fellow citizens with Jesus Christ. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. And James 2.5 says, Hearken to me, my, hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not, the, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? And here's the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. A person who is spiritually poor, that person is really rich. So God exalts the poor. See, poverty is not a problem. Poverty is the sin. No way in the world. In Galatians 6.14, Paul said, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Jesus Christ did many, many, many miracles. But he never, ever touched the poor to make them rich. Never. Never. He'd see a poor person, he'd come and preach them. Now in Matthew eleven five, 5, when um, John the Baptist was in prison, he wanted to find out if Jesus Christ was really, really the Messiah to come, in Matthew 11, verse 5, Jesus Christ told the, uh, in verse 4, he said, Go and show John again those things which ye do uh, hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. What do the, what do the poor need? The gospel. Now, Christ fed the 5,000. There weren't 5,000 poor people. Just 5,000. He fed the 4,000. Fine. But when it comes to Paul, he preached the gospel. That's what they need, their soul salvation. Now, I'm not saying that they, he never, never fed them. I'm sure with the money that was in their um, that was, they received, and uh, um, uh, Judas had the treasury, and I'm sure he would have given to the poor, I'm sure. Matter of fact, when uh, Christ told Judas, go and do what you have to do on that, uh, the Last Supper, the other disciples thought, oh, maybe he told them to go and give some money to the poor. So they were definitely did, were concerned about the poor, but that wasn't the main thing. The main thing, give them the gospel. We have the story in Luke 16 about rich man and Lazarus. We have a rich man. What's his name? Doesn't matter. Just rich man. Doesn't matter. And this man lived a luxurious lifestyle. He fed like a king and died. Woke up in hell. Then this poor guy, his name is Lazarus. It means whom God helps. This guy, they had none of this world's wealth at all. None. But he died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And eternity, Lazarus is now rejoicing in glory. And the rich man, his, his riches are forgotten. He's now in hell suffering completely. And so in this passage, I think we find very, very plainly, the God of Mammon tells us that wealth takes away all problems and it just plain lies. It doesn't. It doesn't. Trust in God, not in Mammon. Second point, this. First thing, poverty can't rob us of happiness. Second, 
trust in riches can't bring us happiness. This is a very, very sobering thought. Money can't make you happy. It can't. It'll take care of some bills, but on the long run, doesn't satisfy. There's a command to rich believers. Faith is being tried to keep you humble. The rich young ruler coming to Christ, seeking a place in heaven, but his money stopped him from going there, or his love of money stopped him from going there. You have the thorny ground hearers, they hear about the word of God, continue a while, but the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, rob them of any fruit at all. Then you have Zacchaeus, a rich, rich, rich tax collector, a thief. He sees Christ, puts his faith in him, and straight away, his bondage to the love of money is broken. He says, I'll give half my goods to the poor, straight away, without being told. And also, if I've stolen anything from anybody, I'm going to pay him back four times the amount, like the Bible says. So straight away, the bondage of money was off and broken because he trusted in Christ. You see, we can have money, but don't let it uh, control you. David gave abundantly, and Abraham had, had heaps and heaps and heaps from, from, from God's goodness. We find true humility is developed through people who if they understand the temporal value of finances. They're just temporal. The truth about money is it does not satisfy in the end. No matter how much you get, a few more circles on a piece of paper, a few more things added to your uh, list of achievements. That's all it is. Have you ever played Monopoly? You get a great big massive board and you have some dice and you have a whole lot of little squares that represent blocks of land and houses and, and, uh, and hotels and that. And you throw the dice and see what you can get. And the whole, guy, whole idea is get everyone else bankrupt and you become the rich person. And they played the game, played the game there with a vicious, vicious type of uh, desire to want to win. And the guy who wins is all these houses and hotels and lands. What happens then? Put it back in the box. Close it up. Put it away. Where is it? Gone. And life is simply one great big massive game monopoly for some people. Get as much as you can, as much as you can. Doesn't matter who you tread over, doesn't matter who you destroy, just get and get and get. And the whole idea is get more. Why? So you can kick the bucket and leave it all behind and let all your life be, be uh, used for the purpose of getting getting more. It's a humbling thought to think that that gift you have of accumulating a lot of resources only has temporal value. That's all. Well, God has a way to humble people, not to break them, humble them, and see the truth in life. The rich saint is on the same level as the poor saint. A.T. Robinson said, the cross is the greatest leveler of men. When God chose his apostles, did he go to the universities? No. Those with doctor's degree? No, no, no. Fishermen? Tax collectors, get them. And what did they do? Ah, well, they led the whole church. And Christianity was spearheaded by them. And who were they? Oh, humble people. That's all. Now, the Apostle Paul may have been the only learned one amongst a whole lot of them. But that's it. The rich person is made to see a real value of riches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, 18, the Bible says, For our light affliction, referring to all the suffering that he was, him and other apostles went through, was but for a moment working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporal, but things which are not seen, they're eternal. They're eternal. Money is given to us to spend. By God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, God gives a person the gift to be rich or not. That's God's gift. Some people, no matter how hard they try, they'll never, ever, ever crack the barrier to get rich. Never. Other people, and they make money. You know? They look this way and they make money. I mean, people are just like that. It's just God's goodness to them. Now, what we do is what we get. That's important. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 21. God looks upon money as being something that is not permanent. It's like the flowers of the field. Look at them. Beautiful. Wonderful. But then summer, summer comes along, the sun comes, and they die completely. And they wither and die away. And riches is like that. They're temporal in value. 
In Proverbs 23, verse 5, the Bible says, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Nothing is wrong with riches. Let me say that again, 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 again. It's trust in them that is wrong. They're an excellent resource for doing God's will. But trusting in them makes them idolatry, and that's what's wrong. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 to 25, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but being corruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth ever. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So James is saying, you rich people, the glory you're having, it's only temporal. In this world, people exalt that which is temporal, that which what they can see. But the true riches, they can't see it. The true riches, they're blinded by it. In the Middle East, grass is grown very, very, for a short period of time. And because over there you have uh, uh, very, very dry summers. Like in Wagga Wagga, a place like that, if you go to Wagga Wagga in the summertime, you won't see a green blade anywhere. It's going to be brown, just normal. It's just, just a fact of life because over there it's so dry and so, so hot, all the grass just dries off. And same thing in the Middle East, the, the summertime, it grows, it, you might have a beautiful grass growing in spring, then it just grows off and dies. And you can see this beautiful richness end up in nothing. And God's saying now, that is the way for a person who puts his faith and trust in money. Today it's beautiful, it's spring, but tomorrow, winter, it's gone. We have in Luke chapter 12, 15 to 21, the rich fool. And God hasn't called too many people a fool, but this one he called a fool. Because this person over here worked hard all his life and got a lot of profit from all his hard labour. And he said, so, so much profit, you need to build new barns to store all of his goods. And God said, you fool. Because tonight, from the day you were born, I planned to take your life from you. Now, whose will all this stuff be that you've, you've uh, worked so hard for? And think, you get to live once on this earth. You like to do something that's going to last and beneficial. But working for something that is temporal and little benefit, why waste your life doing that? Why waste your life doing that? Spend your life doing something. Something that's profitable, something that benefits the, the people, something that brings glory to the Lord. In conclusion, I would like to read to you a, uh, a brief statement that Alec Mottier wrote. He said, The poor man is enabled to go on with God in spite of the adverse circumstance of poverty because the wisdom from on high has opened the glories of heaven to him and he counts them richer than all the trials on earth. So in this passage over here, the poor guy going through trials, he can turn to God and rejoice and say, thank you, Lord, because I've got nothing over here, but boy, I've got stuff in heaven. I've got stuff in heaven waiting for me. The rich man is enabled to go on with God in spite of the snares and enticements of wealth because wisdom from on high has opened his eyes to the real state of earthly things, how perishable they are, how unsatisfactory they are in the long run, so wisdom opens the eyes both to the glories of heaven and to the hollowness of earth. That's uh, written by um, Alex Mottier. Very, very wise. So we need wisdom from God. Helps understand the circumstance that I'm in, whether rich or poor, I look to God. I trust in him. And Paul said, in all things I learned to be content. Whether I've abounded, whether I've suffered need, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And very important to see that. Never, ever, 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 be convinced or think in any way at all that the God of mammon can ever benefit your life. He never can. The creator can, not the God of mammon. Let's go for prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, and we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. You provide all our needs, absolutely guaranteed. Help us, Lord, not to be tempted away from walking with thee by the God of mammon and all the temporal, temporal pursuits that follow it. Help us, Lord, to look for eternity, eternity, to set our affection on things above, not on things in the earth. And we thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn will be number 400.